Yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit late. It's alright. Hi, Jason. Hello. How's this? Yeah, not bad. Yeah. Hello, my name is Anton Creel. I'm the managing partner of the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management. Today, I'm joined by Jason McDonald, one of our senior trading mentors. And today, we're going to have a chat about Jason's career. Welcome, Jason. Hi, Anton. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, Jason, you've um, been with the Institute now for a year. Uh, you're one of those guys in the market, really, who uh, operated for successfully about 20 years in the market and I guess you're relatively unknown but we obviously know each other I knew of you and due to your successful career and track record we brought you into the Institute to mentor our students um, why don't we uh, start off and go right back to the beginning of your career uh, what happens right at the beginning how did it all begin okay so I came out of university um, in 1992, aged 21, and uh, knew pretty quickly um, when you know going through the milk round process that I wanted to go into investment banking. At that time, wasn't really sure, um, probably didn't really know actually what every part of an investment bank did, but had an inkling and an idea that trading would be something very exciting and attractive to um, have you know, a, a greater sort of in-depth look at. Mm. So did the usual thing of uh, milk round interviews um, and got an offer from what was then known as Barclays to Zoot Web Visa W, which is now mm. Barclays Capital. Mm. So they offered me a job as a graduate trainee. Um, and initially what you do is, um, I'm sure, you know, much like at Goldman Sachs uh, where you started, you go on a, a three to four month sort of whirlwind tour of the bank mm. looking at uh, different parts of the business and I pretty um, pretty quickly knew that um, I certainly wasn't going to be a corporate financier that you know once you've been on the trading floor mm. and got that kind of excitement um, and you know sort of been part of that really quite in sort of incomparable mm. atmosphere of what a, you know a big trading floor is like that for me um, you know, made my mind up. So I was fortunate enough that I went straight from the rotation onto one of the big uh, proprietary trading desks. Um, and that was actually the event driven, the risk arbitrage desk. Yep. So um, for, you know, those guys out there that don't know what risk arbitrage um, and event driven trading is about, it's um, first of all, it's proprietary trading. So we're trading the bank's own capital. Um, and it's a it's quite a specialised area. Um, the risk arbitrage um, refers to takeover situations, so they can be announced situations that um, are already you know they've been announced by the companies. Mm -hmm. um, and there's what's known as a spread and arbitrage between the the company that's doing the acquiring and the acquiree. That's an announced deal. Um, there's also what's known as rumour trage, so trying to spot companies which might be subjected to takeover activity. Um, and the, the event driven side was more things like dual listed companies. So for example, Shell Royal Dutch, Unilever, mm. um, which are both Anglo Dutch companies that have listings in London and Amsterdam. Um, but the, the shares, once you've X'd out the foreign exchange difference, don't necessarily trade at exactly equivalent levels. And so we would play the spread between the cheap side of the um, the company and, yeah. and the in, in inverted commas expensive side, okay. and so we we'd play the spread. Uh, normally, it would be the PLC was was trading cheap to the Dutch company, yeah. the NV. So we'd be trading um, the rate on on, the, on that sort of spread and discount. Um, other situations that we would look at would be what's known as uh, cash extractions. So that's where you're using um, a particular type of option, which is called a warrant, which is basically a call option. And we would trade um, the warrant against the underlying stock. Um, so normally that would be the cash extraction part is when is normally where you're long of the warrant and you're short of the mm. stock against that. Um, <clears throat> so really, that's you know that encapsulates um, 
most of what we did on, on the event driven side and so I was fortunate enough to go straight on to uh, that proprietary training book and I was actually straight in as a number two which was really you know um, quite fortuitous and, and yeah. really beneficial for my career so that's where I started um, at Beza W I moved on um, to Credit Suisse First Boston after that Credit Suisse First Boston actually bought the equities businesses of Barclays so we all migrated over from the equities business of, of Beza W into Credit Suisse First Boston and I then became part of a group known as Modal Capital, which is an, another internal, yep. um, is actually more like an internal hedge fund at Credit Suisse. Um, and at that point, this was around the late 90s, um, so 97 was when Barclays sold their businesses to CSFB. Mm. Um, at that stage, I was actually given my own book. So previously, I'd been part of a book which was actually, um, at its peak, was about a billion pounds um, in terms of the size of the portfolio. Um, when I was given my own book, um, I was then controlling uh, about a quarter of a billion dollars. And that again was in the event driven arena. Mm. So the thing about event driven is it, it gives you, it makes you very disciplined and very process driven because you have to be aware of, of the sort of minutiae and, and um, small elements of deals that could cause a deal to break. Mm. So that's really a good foundation for then going on to fundamental investing because mm. it means that you've got a real eye for detail. Yeah. So, as I said, you know, moved over to the internal uh, hedge fund at, at CSFB called Modal, uh, where I stayed until um, almost um, exactly coinciding with the um, the implosion of the internet, and yeah. the tech boom, which obviously we were both in the market yeah. at the same time um, for for that particular event. Um, which was not, you know, uh, sort of any kind of foresight on my part, just a, a massive coincidence that I actually ended up um, getting headhunted from CSFB to go and set up a, a volatility and event driven hedge fund, oh, which is obviously perfect. quite so good timing yeah. Yeah, um, for that. So I went to a company called Mako, yeah. um, which specialised in, specialises still in um, options market making, and the idea there was to set up a, an event driven and volatility hedge fund which I did um, for three and a half years. And after that, subsequently, I went back to proprietary trading at the banks. Mm. So my career, this is then, we're into the sort of early double O's. Yeah. Um, I then went back to a German bank called Commerz Bank and joined um, quite a big team there, where there were six of us, three of whom were the senior traders. We had a couple of analysts and um, a, a sort of Japanese specialist. And that was, uh, that was a much more fundamentally driven prop book. So now I'm kind of moving away from the event driven side of things yeah. and moving more into the long short yeah. area. And you know, this was mainly specializing in the UK and Europe, um, but also we had quite a, a flexible mandate there. So, you know, we were getting involved in North America and in the developed markets in Asia. So, you know, Singapore and Hong yeah. Kong, Australia was, was a good place for me in particular, actually. Um, as well as doing um, some quite structured trades in South Africa, yeah. uh, which sounds a bit exotic, but actually South Africa, if you think about it, you know, it's got a very developed stock market, and it's all based on the kind of Anglo-Saxon, you yeah, know, yeah. UK yeah. regulatory regime. So it's actually, you know, a really easy market to yeah. um, to transition to. Um, so. You know, we were running about uh, two to three billion euros at that point um, at Commerce Bank. And then subsequently, I ended up at uh, Lehman Brothers. I'm not sure that we were there at the same time. I think I may have just missed you. Yeah. I think you left just before I came, actually. 06. I came at the beginning of 06. Okay. So. We probably just overlapped by yeah. a month. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's when you went to JP Morgan, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So um, I was at Lehman Brothers um, only actually for quite a short period, just for a year before I went mm. to uh, a Canadian bank, Toronto Dominion, yeah. where I um, set up uh, another prop, uh, another equity proprietary trading book. Um, I had three guys working under, underneath me, including my brother actually, who was my analyst, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's that's where I finished my trading career in the city. So that sort of takes you through up until you know 2010. So basically yeah. an 18-year prop trading yeah. career. I consider myself exceptionally fortunate to have been able to spend my entire time trading 
the bank's money and yeah. and the hedge fund shareholders' money rather than you know being in a client facing business, which for me was was not as exciting or as interesting because yeah. the thing about prop trading is that it's you're pitting yourself against the market and yeah. um, you know it's it's there's nowhere to hide. It's it's really simple to work out who's sure. who's performing and who isn't performing because yeah. you've got your P and L. Exactly, and it's not you know you can't sort of say well, it's because we had a good client business, therefore we got lots of flow and we could kind of piggyback yeah. on the back of that. It yeah. is you against yeah. the market. It's so only one way to keep score there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and so you know for me that was just really stimulating. Pure. Yeah. Yeah.